Okay. Welcome. We are so glad you're here. So for some of y'all, this is being recorded now, and it's being recorded so that you can go back and watch it at another time. Our speaker and the sponsors and everybody is just great, and it's just a fun time to be here. So many people think that a support group is a pity party. You sit around in a circle, and you're, you know, woe is me. Well, nobody wants to have Parkinson's, and that's certainly true. But the bottom line is that we are here to support you and to live the best life possible with Parkinson's or any movement disorder. And so I want to thank everybody for coming. For some of you, um, you know, the crowd right here uh, that we're recording didn't hear it, but it was fun to sing a song because this is what we do in our vocal exercise music therapy class every Monday. And you're all welcome to join us. We really do have a lot of fun in that class. And uh, believe me, people say, well, I can't sing, I, I, and it doesn't sound good. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I just make joyful noise myself. I can't sing at all. But anyway, I'm Mary Jane Berry, the facilitator. Oh, I'm getting a message. They're not seeing the screen. The Zoom crowd is not seeing my screen stream. Uh, let's see. We'll do a stop share, and we'll come back and do a share. Well, that's that one, but I want to make sure you're, okay, you're just, you want to do that. Okay. We might need to move this if you're going to hang on to it then. Okay. So anyway, we're just tickled pink that you're going to be here, but I am going to go back to the slide now anyway, though. So Deb, make sure with, you can see the slide. Deb and Don. Okay. Are y'all seeing the slide? Okay. Okay. Now door prizes, just so that you'll know. Uh, be sure you get a ticket. Did everybody get a ticket? We're going to have, we got some really, really good door prices coming up. And if my husband promised you a new car, I'm sorry, the cars did not come in this time. <laughs> but anyway, that we wanted to say thank you. By the way, we have a Zoom team. Uh, I'm just so fortunate. We're getting more and more helpers. And this is, this, it's not one person show. We're all on the same team to help each other. And I'm so fortunate to have some folks that uh, have been helping out. I've got, uh, John Henry, who's helping me out on the camera. And in the back there, I've got Don and Deb, and they are recording and keeping up with everything. Plus, I had a, a whole bevy of folks that were helping me out to set up. So I want to thank everyone. And maybe they'll be lucky and they'll get a door prize, but I don't know. <laughs> the agenda, the agenda you can see is going to be great. Uh, we're starting out promptly on time. We always have a social from 2.30 to 3, just so that you get a chance to visit with everyone and get cookies. By the way, if you need to get up in the middle of the meeting to get cookies, they're all, there's cookies and water over there to the right. So help yourself, my right. Uh, let's see, the speaker is going to be Dr. Corinne Jones. It's going to be great on Parkinson's speech and swallowing issues. And that's why I thought this was perfect to sing. That way you got to hear some of these folks because that's so important. All righty. I want to thank all of my sponsors. You know, I need, in addition to the volunteers that help us, we need the sponsors to help fund us because we are now needing to pay for our meeting facilities as well as for our instructors. We have a Monday class. I mentioned we have a physical therapy. On Wednesdays, we also have a yoga instructor. And so we're paying these instructors, but soon we will be having an art instructor. More to come. You're going to hear about that in just a second. But I would like to thank right now Medtronic. Medtronic is right over here. He's pointing to Medtronic right there. Hopefully you guys are seeing him. Super. This is David Ott, and they have a DBS group. And uh, they've got a table over here for those that are in person. For those that are on the Zoom, just to let you know, this is going to be all in the newsletter. So thank you, David, for your, uh, gosh, yeah, we just appreciate it so much. Okay, Abbott. Abbott was here. But, oh, Abbott is here. Stand up. We're going to make you stand up, Donnie, so he can see it. Yeah, there's Donnie right there. And that is Donnie uh, and Damon, and they are with Abbott, another DBS group. So if any of you guys out there in the Zoom crowd as well as in the audience have a DBS unit that is one of these uh, pharmaceutical companies that made it, they will be happy to talk to you about it. So thank you. Uh, Supernus. Supernus is here. Will. Oh, Will was going to be here, but he was not able to make it. But uh, Supernus is another big sponsor for us, and we pr greatly appreciate that. Then we also have New Placid, which is Lori Robinson, and she was not able to make it this time. 
But uh, again, this is regarding hallucinations and delusions. So one of the nice things is if you ever have any of these situations that happen to you, feel free to even give me a call and I can connect you with the rep. So feel free to always know that. <clears throat> Accorda, all right. Oh, Antonio, come on up here. This is Antonio, or so because we can see you. Here he is. And his uh, co-partner was Armand, who just happened to leave. But this is Antonio. Antonio is with one of the drugs that is one of the off-time medication drugs, and we appreciate it. Plus, you're going to be having a uh, uh, luncheon coming up. That's right. Yes. Did you say hi? Uh, hello, and thank you for being here. Uh, Antonio Castellanos with Accorda, and we do have a new product uh, on the on-demand category. It's um, uh, an inhaler. So uh, for those off periods, uh, this is something that you will inhale and, and, and it will address both mechanically and cognitively some of the issues you're having. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to go by the booth and I'll be more than happy to talk to you. Thanks again for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on July 14th, they will be hosting a luncheon. And uh, this is going to be out in the newsletter. And in fact, Nita, uh, if you'd like to stand up real quick. <clears throat> Anita is my chairperson for the educational luncheon. She's absolutely awesome. And so you will be sending your uh, RSVPs to her. And again, this will be in the newsletter to get it. So thank you, Anita, very, very much. Okay. I want to be sure to tell you about all of our, our other support groups that we do have. Uh, we have a caregiver support group. I just love that, that uh, visual. <laughs> I thought it was so typical, you know, it's like a uh, chill out people and handling it. You know, that's what you, we always have to kind of say, it seems like it's caregivers, but uh, we meet on the second Tuesday, second Thursday of every month. So if you're a caregiver out there and you want some great uh, time to just talk with others, it's, it's a very informal group. No, no speakers or anything. It's very informal. And in fact, um, Chris has some booklets back there. Chris was the one giving out the name tags. And there's a booklet there that Davis Finney sent us on caregivers. So feel free to take one if you did not get one. Uh, we have a GADS meeting, which GADS is for DBS. Judy, stand up real quick. Judy Mayo is just absolutely awesome. Oh, Judy, you didn't stand up long enough. He wants to get your picture. Yeah, so that the Zoom crowd can see you. There you go. Oh, and she's going to show off her dog. Yes. There you go. Anyway, Judy, thank you so much. She runs this support group. It's the third Wednesday of every month. We've got a meeting coming up on June 21st. Do you have a speaker, Judy? I don't remember. Okay, so it would be a time for you just to talk, and that's a great opportunity. Plus, many of these pharmaceutical, um, the reps from the different companies uh, will be there. So that'll be super. All right. Our mantra. We have a mantra here, and it's based upon to educate as well as exercise, as well as socialize. So that's actually part of this whole meeting too. We incorporate all three of these in our meeting. Um, and so bottom line is we also try to do it with our classes. So with that said, these are the classes that I already mentioned to you. We have the vocal exercise and music therapy that's on uh, Mondays and Janie is our speech therapist. We have our chair yoga, which is really fun. Uh, well, all these are really fun. And ping pong. Now, I don't know if Don's here. Uh, Don, uh, I do know uh, Chuck and Mark. Y'all are both are here and y'all are in the ping pong group, aren't you? All right, these fellas are over there. So they like to play ping pong and it's an opportunity just to get out and to move and to exercise. So all of this is in your newsletter as well as in the website so that you can find out all about this. So by all means, if you want to do any of this stuff, please join us. Okay. Now, I want to talk. Julie, if you'd like to, can you walk them on up here a little bit? Julie is here with Hope. This was announced in our email. Julie is going to be going to the World Parkinson Congress. Now, you might not have even realized that there was a World Parkinson Congress. This is an international group that uh, is just uh, phenomenal. I mean, I've only followed it online and I've never been, but they're meeting this year. They only meet like every, every three years. They only meet every three years. And this year it's going to be in Barcelona, Spain. This is Julie. And Julie is not only a Davis Finney ambassador, she is also a Michael J. Fox ambassador, but most important, she is a GAPS ambassador. So she will be representing us in Spain, and but she sometimes needs a little bit of help to, to get there. So I'll let you kind of talk here. So the World Parkinson's Congress this year in Barcelona, 
Uh, July is a very expensive month to travel to Barcelona. It's the high season. So airline fare alone was uh, $3,300. And that wasn't for first class. That was for a little squishy seat. Um, unless I wanted a 37-hour trip coming back, and I could not do 37 hours in an airplane. We're sitting in airports for 15 hours at a stretch. Anyway, um, anything that you can do to help me get there, I would greatly appreciate it. I have a GoFundMe. I think the link is up there somewhere. Um, anything will help. And I will definitely do my best to represent you all and represent you well. And um, one of the reasons I really wanted to go this year is my good friend and buddy, John Humphreys, which some of you may or may not know. He's a well-known Parkinson's advocate and been, have, has been involved for many years and mentored me on how to be a good advocate. He was key at representing us at Washington DC during the policy forum and meeting with lots of legislators to get things changed so life could be better for us. Well, he died sadly last month and he was kind of my partner in crime. And he would always go to World Parkinson's. So I'm going in his place because there's a lot of people across the world that want to do something to honor him. So this is my way of honoring him. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Julie was a young onset. Uh, Parkinson's, as you know, anybody younger than 50, when you get Parkinson, is considered to be a young onset Parkinson disease person. And uh, she has now uh, started out then and is just quite an advocate. And we want to thank you, Judy, Julie, and also hopefully you'll be getting some stuff. So, all righty. So next one, no, but I, before we talk about our speaker, I have somebody that wanted to make an announcement. Uh, Okay, here it was. Uh, yes, occasionally we have people that have products. This is Apokin. I don't know if anybody is on Apokin. That's another off medication. I We cannot give it an, an, or anything like that, but uh, somebody can always leave it hanging around. And if somebody is in need of it, they can pick it up. You know what I mean? We, but we, can, we, we are not dispensing meds, but we're sharing. But I also have another special person I would like to announce. Uh, Cindy, can you come up here for two seconds? We are going to start something brand new. And I really know this is going to be awesome. Uh, we're going to start art therapy. So in addition to music therapy, in addition to yoga exercise, and in addition to uh, ping pong, we now have officially art therapy. We're very, very fortunate to have a world-renowned known artist. Well, known in Sun City. No, <laughs> that's where we're now. But no, no, she has taken best of show. She is quite an, an accomplished artist. Yes, she is. And uh, she's also a very, very dear friend. She went with me to Washington, D.C. when I was speaking up there last year and uh, really kind of fell in love with the Parkinson uh, community and saw the need for art therapy. And so she came back, she's merging, I'd love to do art therapy. And so she's a wonderful instructor, and she's already got other people helping. And I just, we got a table back there. We want you to sign up. So, Cindy, tell us a little bit about art therapy, what you want to do. Okay. So, I've known Mary Jane and Dave for 40 years. And she is such an inspiration. And so, when I went to this conference, they talked about art therapy, and I thought, you know, that's something that I can do. Uh, I'm an artist. I'm a retired muralist. I'm involved with the visual arts at uh, Sun City. And I said, you know, that's something that I would like to do. So the classes will be in Sun City. They will be at the worship place. It will be in the afternoon. It will be one to one and a half hours. I will have a painting that's already done. And then I will have a canvas for each person and I will paint along with you. So I will show you how to create the painting. So it's not going to be intimidating. It's going to be fun. It's going to be uh, not very formal. If you want to use a different color, you can. You know, it's going to be just enjoyable so that you can create and expand 
your creativity. But I'm really excited about it, and I hope that you will sign up. I'm, I'm just trolling right now for interested parties. So if you're in the slightest interest uh, in doing this class, please stop by the table back there and sign up. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. And the other important thing to share is free. Yes, you'll give it Yes, it's free. It's free because this is what we're doing as a GAP support group is I'm working to get working with my sponsors to help out, and this is where a lot of this funding is, is going to pay for the church, to pay for these classes, and that sort of thing. So anyway, thank you so much, Cindy. And with that said, I think we're ready for our speaker to come on up. So Dr. Corinne Jones, you can see her right here. She is the professor at Moody College of Communication, Dell Medical School, University of Texas Medical School. And we were very, very fortunate to see uh, Dr. Corinne last year. She spoke at our symposium and was an absolute favorite of the speakers. And so I asked her if she'd come back and just speak with our group. Now, what's a pleasant surprise for me is we get two for one. <laughs> I'll tell you, the big day, y'all, is uh, next Tuesday. Oh, so pretty close, pretty close. So she'll be talking about that. We also have one more slide to share. Why don't you tell about this slide? So um, thank you for helping me uh, promote this study. So I am a researcher at uh, University of Texas, and I have money from the NIH to study swallowing in people with Parkinson disease and how it changes over time. So I also have a slide in, in, my, um, in my presentation as well, and I have flyers over here. So we're looking for people to come to the lab um, at on the UT campus three times, and each visit is six months apart for a swallow study. We're taking people with and without difficulty swallowing. So if you feel like you don't have any troubles but want to contribute, we're, we're happy to take you. I'm going to take a couple months off, um, but please, if you are interested, um, I have a way to, a couple different ways to contact us. Please contact us soon, and then we can get you in our system and, and make sure if you qualify, we can then get you up and running when we, when we start back up after my leave. All right. Yep. So thanks for the um, invitation to come and speak. So as was uh, introduced, I'm a speech language pathologist, and so I actively see patients once a week at uh, at Dell Medical School. Um, and I am fortunate enough to be also a professor at UT, an assistant professor, so I get to teach the next generation of speech language pathologists. And then I'm a researcher, so I get to ask interesting questions and kind of contribute to general knowledge about, um, particularly I'm interested in swallowing, um, but I have field knowledge in speech and, and they, they're quite related. And so I'll, I'll discuss uh, both of those today. And then finally, I'm a granddaughter of someone who had Parkinson's disease. And so um, I, I you know, have, have some life experience um, with, with someone who, who uh, had Parkinson's. So let me see if my we are set up here. Yep. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk both about speech and swallowing. I'll start with speech and then I'll transfer over to swallowing. I'm going to review some anatomy and physiology. So you'll get a, a review of that and then kind of some things that we look out for uh, in people with Parkinson's disease and then ways that we can address that. Um, but just a disclaimer, everyone's issues with speech and swallowing will look different. And so assessment and treatment are going to be very individualized. And so um, it's important if you have issues on your own to not not take any medical advice. And I'm not giving medical advice um, except for go and have your own personal assessment. So in order to speak, in order to communicate verbally, we first need to figure out what we want to say. And I have that in parentheses. I'm not really going to go into that. That's more of a cognitive linguistic process. But once we have figured out what we want to say, then we need to breathe air in. And then we breathe air out. And that breath we call the power source. And so that breath is really important. We close our vocal cords or our vocal folds, and that creates the vibrations that constitute our speech sounds or voice, and we call that the vibrator. And then we move the articulators in our mouth and our throat to shape the sound into the sounds of English, 
um, or Spanish or Japanese or whatever language we're speaking, um, and that we, we call the resonator. So lots of different things go on in order for us to get a message across. So thinking about the respiratory tract, and I'm going to see if I can I'll use the mouse here. So we have the upper respiratory tract here. Um, and this is the nose and the mouth. We're looking from the side here to the larynx. The larynx is our voice box. Uh, and then lower below that is our trachea. It splits off into lungs, um, which has the, the, the bronchi. And then other important structures are the diaphragm. This is a big muscle that attaches to the lower lungs, the rib cage, which we don't see in this picture, and then the chest accessory muscles, uh, which are attached to the rib cage up here. Um, and in order to breathe, to breathe in, it's an active process. So we have to contract the diaphragm. That is, uh, again, along the, the um, bottom walls. We also uh, uh, contract those chest accessory muscles. And that makes the lungs larger. And if there's a larger space, there's a relatively lower, um, ooh, uh, relatively lower air pressure. And so that's what causes air to flow in the lungs. And um, so that, that's always an active process. We can volitionally control it, but if we're sleeping, we have uh, neural centers in the brainstem that help us breathe. Exhalation can be passive or active. So if I just relax the diaphragm, everything will kind of come back into place. And that's kind of what we're doing is we're kind of quietly breathing. If I'm talking, it's an active process. And so I'll engage my abdominal muscles and then I can control the flow of air by making those lungs smaller, which increases the air pressure. And then through a pressure gradient sends the air outside. So that's breathing. If we just start breathing, we're not gonna be able to create any sound. So there's a little bit of air energy sound, but not the vibration that we hear as voice. That is created in the larynx or the voice box. And so if that's the Adam's apple that you feel on your throat, it's a complex of different cartilage structures and muscles. And the primary structure needed to create voice is called the vocal folds. Sometimes you hear them as vocal cords or actual kind of flaps of tissue, not like a long rope or a cord. Um, and how that works is we voluntarily close the vocal folds. And then when we breathe out, the vocal folds will vibrate against each other and that creates sound. Uh, and we can change the length of those vocal folds similar to changing the length of a guitar string in order to change the pitch of our voice. So if we make it a little bit tighter, that will cause a faster vibration and a higher pitched voice and vice versa. So I have here just an image of what we see. This would be if we kind of took a cut down the front, the vocal folds are closed and so there's no air coming out and then they gradually open that allows air energy out and then they gradually close and this cyclical increase and decrease of air pressure is picked up by our ears and is registered as sound. And I have uh, just an animation of if we're looking from above these two white, um, pearly white flaps of tissue, those are the vocal folds and they flap together in the breeze that you're breathing out. And that periodic um, vibration causes what we hear as voice. And so if I'm just voicing, it would, it, you know, you'd hear just, ah. Uh, and so we do a lot more than just that um, in order to get our message across. And so then we have this complex of different structures, both uh, hard structures and muscles in the mouth and the throat that shape that energy into the sounds of our language. Um, so lots of different things here. Um, there are some that we call a resonator. So the soft palate or the velum here separates the oral cavity from the nasal cavity. 
And that is lifted for most of the sounds of English. So if you say, ah, uh, and then plug your nose, the sound won't change very much. So try that. Uh, so that means that the air is mostly coming out of the mouth. We have some sounds in the English language that we call nasal sounds. So this velum is lowered. And so most of the air comes out of the nose. And so if you pinch and unpinch, then the sound will change. So if we say mm, and do the same thing, mm, mm, mm. so that's most of the energy is coming out of the nose. And we learn from a very early age how to control that muscle in order to create the sounds. Um, I speak with a Northern Midwestern accent. So I might not have all of the air come out of my mouth when I say some vowels, um, but uh, that's sad. Okay, and then this is actually an MRI of someone speaking. And so you can see how skilled and how small these movements are. And you can see that soft palate lift up and down here as well. So again, to speak, we need to first inhale and then we exhale and produce voice. And then we move those articulators to shape sound. And again, it takes a long time, a few years for us to, to learn how to do this. Um, and, but it's one of those things, once we master it, it is, we call it an overlearn task. And so uh, we can do it pretty much without thinking. And so uh, thinking about respiration, voice, and speech in the context of Parkinson's disease, uh, we know that voice and speech impairments can occur in up to 90% of people with Parkinson's. Um, and this is because these are motor tasks. These are movements. And so like all, all the other movements that are impacted by Parkinson's, these are certainly subject to that. Also, we see in people with Parkinson's disease that internal cueing kind of turns down. So we see that in handwriting, how that sometimes gets smaller. We see that in gait, how those steps sometimes get uh, smaller. That's the same thing with speech. You know, people seem to think that they're speaking at a, a normal pace and a normal loudness, but um, things kind of just get smaller. Um, and then, unfortunately, levodopa and deep brain stimulation don't have big impacts on speech and voice. Um, they can certainly have have some helpful impacts in, in some individuals, but if we, you know, look at uh, big groups as a whole, there's not a huge thing, a, a huge impact. Um, and then also, all of these are impacted by normal aging, and so there's there's a couple different things working uh, working against you here. So specifically respiration changes that we see in Parkinson's, we, there might be some obstructions, so blockages to the airway. Um, you might have some reduced compliance of those ribs um, or kind of changes in how the brain controls breathing. And that might appear as shortness of breath, noisy breathing, sleep apnea, um, respiratory swallowing in coordination. So we actually can't breathe and swallow at the same time. Um, and then decreased cough, the decreased ability to cough. Because again, for those things, we need that big breath. There are different things that we can do to help improve functioning of respiration, um, inspiratory and expiratory muscle strengthening, again, to, to work on those muscles. But any kind of aerobic ex exercise will help with that as well. And so that's another, another one of those miracle benefits of exercise um, that we see in Parkinson's. Voice specific changes in Parkinson's disease, the way those, those folds of tissue might not come together as much or as well, they might not come together in a symmetric way. So that changes how the voice sounds. There's again, changes to how the brain controls those muscles. And then any changes in respiratory patterns will change the ability for those vocal folds to vibrate. And that we might hear a soft voice, breathy voice. We might hear in some people a tremor in the voice and that's similar again to the tremor in the hand. The same, uh, again, these are muscles that are controlling the voice. We might hear a higher pitch or a decreased pitch range or some uh, voice breaks or even stopping of the voice, which we call voice arrest. 
voice treatment. Thyroplasty is a surgical treatment that physically brings the vocal folds closer together. Speech pathologists don't do it, ENT doctors do. Um, also vocal fold injections are an option. Those also bring the vocal folds closer together so they're better able to vibrate. And then voice therapy is also an option. And voice therapy is slightly different than speech therapy. If you think about your LSVT or other speech programs, this is really focusing on the quality of the voice and not necessarily the clarity of the speech. Uh, but again, all of these are gonna be very personalized to what, what specifically is going on. Speech changes in Parkinson's disease are impacted by just the general motor changes, because again, all of these small muscles uh, are impacted by Parkinson's, and then reduced effort, again, that reduced cueing, and then again, that reduced respiration. So breathing, 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 breathing is important, and, and we'll come back to that for our exercise portion. Um, and so we might hear speech changes at the slow speech rate. We might hear some unclear speech, uh, imprecise consonants or distorted vowels. Sometimes we have the medical term of hypokinetic dysarthria or festinated speech. Sometimes speech will speed up and similar to how gait walking kind of speeds up as well. Uh, some people with Parkinson's do have uh, episodes of stuttering, and that's not uncommon, and then uh, reduced pitch inflections as well. So speech therapy is actually very well studied in Parkinson's disease. Um, it can improve with external cueing. Um, so one thing that we do a lot, quite a bit in speech therapy is work with the people who you are speaking with, your communication partners, because communication is a two-way street and there's a lot that other people can do to help that process. Uh, there are two programs, LSVT Loud and Speak Out. These are focused on creating a lot of energy and intention behind speech, just because of that reduced internal cueing. Um, so people ne not necessarily are more quiet or, or speak softer, but it's just they don't have as much energy or intention behind their message. And, and these programs kind of retrain you to, to um, do this, to speak with more intention and to speak more clearly, and they have really good evidence behind them. And then the Speak 5 is the device that you see in the picture here. It's worn kind of like a hearing aid, and it actually injects a little bit of noise into the ear, kind of like when you're at a noisy bar. And so there's a reflex that when we are in a noisy situation, we automatically speak louder. And so this just builds on that reflex. And so, you know, we get, it's almost kind of like garbled speech into the ear and then people automatically speak louder and that really helps other people to understand. Um, now I'm going to transition over into swallowing. So swallowing is important not only for getting food and liquid, nutrition and hydration into the body, but it also brings us a lot of joy. This is my first daughter um, at about nine months. And so, you know, one thing I like to talk about when I'm talking about swallowing is to have you think about your comfort food. So if you've had a hard day, it could be a drink too. If you've had a hard day, you go home, like what, what do you reach for to make you feel a little bit better? Um, with my daughter and similar with me, it's pasta. So anything, anything with carbs. Um, so, you know, it, eating and drinking is more than just getting that nutrition and hydration. It's a lot of pleasure. We have a lot of social interactions, uh, family interactions, cultural interactions that uh, happen around food. And so um, this is one of my drives is to really improve the ability for people to eat and drink the things they want so that they can participate and, and um, have this joy. And then I just have a recent picture of my daughter here who still really enjoys eating. Um, she still has that, that joie de vivre, or I call it joie de manger. Um, and so it's it's been really fun as a swallowing specialist to, to see her grow up and, and really like eating. All right, so now we're gonna talk about swallowing and it's a lot of the same anatomy here, um, but we use these muscles in slightly different ways. Uh, so we have first here, um, the jaw here, this is a side view, the jaw and the teeth. 
The tongue is a large structure and actually goes really far back into the throat. We have the uvula, the soft palate that also raises when we swallow. If you take a glass of milk and then someone says something funny and you laugh and milk shoots out of your nose, that's a, a failure right here. Um, we have, uh, it's not well uh, laid out in this image, but the larynx, the voice box is here and that closes when we swallow to protect the airway so food and liquid doesn't go down. There's a normal flap of tissue here called the epiglottis. Um, and that's a flap of cartilage and that will, when we swallow that flips over the larynx to close it off. And then directly behind the airway is the esophagus. And so that's where the food and liquid goes. And so having the airway right next to where the food and liquid goes can pose a problem. And we've all had things go down the wrong pipe. And when that happens, they literally go down the wrong pipe. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how we actually do the process of swallowing. Um, and just to note, the speech pathologists are experts from the lips to the top of the esophagus. GI doctors are the experts from the esophagus down. And then occupational and physical therapists are experts at getting food to the mouth. So there, it's a multidisciplinary process. I'm gonna focus mostly on what happens in the mouth and in the throat. So we have three kind of distinct stages of swallowing. The first is the oral stage. So what happens to the food and drinks once we put it in the mouth? This is under voluntary control. So I can put something in my mouth. I can take a, a bite of chocolate chip cookie and I can chew it on the right side of my mouth and I can move it over to the left side and I can chew and I can stop. I can spit it out if I don't think it's as good of a cookie, but they were, they were yummy today. Um, so this is in, in our voluntary control. Once I have chewed it um, I, and prepared everything to swallow, if it's a sip of water, I don't need to, to do much to get it ready. Um, but then I bring the food here, which is in green, to the middle of the tongue. And then I put the tip of the tongue against the hard palate right behind the teeth. And that strips back and that pushes the food and liquid into the throat. Um, and once it hits a certain, uh, certain sensory receptors on the back of the tongue, that triggers what we think of as the more reflexive part of the swallow. So that we call the pharyngeal stage. That's what's what happens in the throat. Um, so once the food or liquid gets into the throat, then there's a kind of series of things that happen all at the same time. That soft palate uvula closes off the nasal cavity. The larynx begins to close. The epiglottis flips over the larynx to protect the airway. There's an area here at the entrance of the esophagus that opens up. The tongue presses back against the back wall of the throat, and all of that pushes the food or liquid into the esophagus while protecting the airway. All of this happens in about 700 milliseconds. And to get food from the lips to the esophagus, it involves 31 pairs of muscles. So it's a pretty complex thing, a pretty complex task, and we don't really think about, think about it too much. And then once the food and liquid goes into the esophagus, it starts the esophageal phase. This is completely reflexive. There's really not much we can do on our own to change it, um, but we have kind of a gradual relaxation and contraction, relaxation below the food and liquid, contraction above, kind of squeezing like a tube of toothpaste, pushing that down through the esophagus and into the stomach. So I have an example here. This is an x-ray video of someone swallowing. I'm going to label some of the areas on here. I have the oral cavity. We can't see that too much. Uh, the jaw, the tongue, again, is that big structure. The soft palate is up around there. We can see the spine, the esophagus, the airway, and the larynx. And so this is a, a, a healthy adult. The first they'll be um, swallowing liquids, doing a couple swallows in a row, and then they'll be swallowing a pudding-like texture. So you'll be able to see how fast the structures are moving, how none of the, um, you'll be able to see the food and liquid is black, 
none of it gets into the airway and there's very little kind of left over on the structures afterwards. Yeah, so that's happening in the throat and then there's the, the solid. Yeah, so I, I think it's fascinating and I one of the reasons I, I love what I do. Um, and so now this is someone with what we call dysphagia, so difficulty swallowing. And this is a, a pretty severe example. There's a, a huge gradation between what we saw before and what we'll see here. There is a little bit of residue already in the throat from a previous swallow. Um, let's see. This person is having difficulty moving the food back uh, or the liquid back in the mouth. They need multiple swallows to get the liquid down. Some of it is spilling into the airway and getting um, below the larynx and into the trachea. And then they were being cued to cough. Um, again, this is an extreme example, but um, you know, if, imagine you know, if this was going on, how hard it would be to, to get through a meal. So we wanna try to prevent people from, from getting to this point or if they're already here to help them get back to enjoying the foods and liquids without having this kind of difficulty. So what do we see or what do we think about for swallowing difficulty in people with Parkinson disease? Uh, people might have upper limb motor issues um, and that can cause difficulty feeding oneself. And again, that's handled mostly by our PT and our OT friends. Uh, we might have decreased sensation or awareness, and that can cause less frequent swallowing of the saliva that builds up in our mouth and throat, and then that causes drooling. So science shows that people with Parkinson's disease don't create more saliva. They just aren't aware of what builds up in their mouth and throat, and so they don't swallow it as often, and so it spills out. Um, and then also some kind of cognitive and, and mood difficulties can create low eating, decreased appetite, or, or reduced interest in eating and drinking. Thinking about what happens more in the mouth specifically, we might have slow or uncoordinated tongue movements that lead to residue stuck in the mouth or food spilling out of the mouth. Um, people might break food and liquid into multiple swallows, and that can cause some slow eating as well. Um, or difficulty getting the swallow started. That happens in other motor systems in Parkinson's disease, and that can be part of uh, swallowing as well, and that can cause some slow eating. Um, in the throat, we might have a delayed trigger of that reflex. And so if there's a delayed trigger of that reflex, that means that the there's food and liquid in the throat while the airway is still open. So that can cause a risk for food and liquid entering the airway. We might have slow reduced movement to the muscles of the throat and that can result in that residue. So that buildup of stuff. And then in the index, we might have slowed transit as, as it goes, um, as the food goes through the, the esophagus and the lower GI tract. That can cause reflux or, or a reduced appetite as well, because you just feel fuller for longer because it, the food is lower moving through. There's some consequences of dysphagia. So again, if you're not eating or drinking enough, you can have some dehydration and malnutrition that can cause weight loss. If food and liquid mixes with the bacteria in the oral cavity and enters in the airway, or if food is refluxed up and enters into the airway, that can cause pneumonia. And so that's a, a pretty serious consequence that we uh, are concerned about in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, and it's actually one of the, the high, one of the leading causes of death in people with Parkinson's disease. And then finally, we have a decreased quality of life because you know, we're not able to, to do the things that we enjoy. Um, and like these are, sad and scary, but I like to flip the coin is that with speech pathologists, if we can get you in and, and get you working with us, we can prevent all of these things. And so bring you back to eating and drinking the things that you want, decrease your risk for pneumonia and, and malnutrition and dehydration. And so 
I like to, to think of the positive and, and try to help people get back instead of worry about the negatives happening. So how might you know if you had a swallowing problem? Things that you could look out for. And I've also shared the PDF and this will be recorded. Um, so don't worry about um, remembering all of these. But if you've lost weight without trying, uh, if you try to, if you tend to avoid drinking liquids, have heartburn or a sore throat, uh, drooling, uh, as we talked about, feeling that you need to cough or choke during or after meals, feeling that you have food stuck in your throat somewhere, trouble keeping food or liquid in the mouth, trouble moving food backwards in the mouth, um, trouble swallowing pills. Pills are difficult for everyone. Pills are actually, they're the only solid food that we eat that we don't chew. And so we have to actively prevent our kind of willingness to chew it. And we often take it with water. And so then we have to combine a liquid and a solid. So it's, it can be tricky. Uh, losing appetite, um, having voice changes, having kind of a gurgly sounding voice. Because again, if there's a uh, liquid on the vocal folds and they vibrate when we speak, then we can kind of hear that gurgly sound. Feeling like it takes a long time to eat a meal um, or having a fever for no apparent reason. That can be a sign of kind of a low grade infection. So if something goes wrong, how do we fix it? Um, similar to voice and speech, Parkinson's meds and deep brain stimulation often don't uh, fix swallowing problems, um, but we do have good evidence for working with a speech language pathologist. And so again, this is gonna be very individualized for what is specifically going on with each patient, but we can do things to compensate. So to change how the food and liquid goes down the throat, uh, we can change the textures of liquids and solids. Uh, we can have people swallow in different positions. And then if things are very severe, we can go to a feeding tube. I really don't like going to a feeding tube and there's really not good evidence that feeding tubes really help people live longer. And it's certainly, there is certainly evidence that can decrease quality of life, but this is a conversation uh, and a decision that, that you would need to make um, on your own. Also, I'm not a huge fan of thickening liquids or softening solids, um, just because if those do get into the airway, they're actually harder to get out of the airway. Um, and they're, um, they're kind of a quick fix for if, if you're in the hospital after an acute event, but on the long haul, um, I, I'm just personally not a, a huge fan of them. Then we can actually do correction. There are things that we can do to change how the structures are moving um, through different types of surgeries. And that would be either with an ENT or with a GI doctor um, or rehabilitation with a speech language pathologist. And we have some pretty good evidence-based um, treatments that can, uh, can get you back to eating and drinking the things that you want. So in conclusion, um, voice, vocal communication involves breathing, voice and speech. Um, so it's, it's pretty complex and swallowing is also another one of those complex processes using all of, uh, or a lot of the same muscles. All of these can be impacted by Parkinson's disease in, in slightly different ways. Um, and evaluation and treatment are gonna be really specific to the individual. So finally, with some considerations, consider um, reaching out to get a baseline evaluation. So if you're having difficulties, certainly reach out to get an evaluation. But if you're not having difficulties, it can be helpful to get in and get an evaluation anyways. So if you get one of those x-ray studies or you meet with someone and they take a look at how you're speaking, that can be really good information to then build off of if things do change. Um, and then there could also be something that a speech pathologist might find that can that you can act on um, early on to try to prevent some of the, the more severe changes. Um, also, it's important for you to think about the social situations that are important to you and the foods and liquids that are important to you. So if it's really important to you that you FaceTime with your grandchildren, let your doctor and your speech pathologist know that. And then we can tailor what we do to, to those activities that are really important to you. 
Also, if you feel like life is not going to be worth living, if you can't have your morning coffee, let your speech pathologist know, and then we can work to, to get those priority things and to keep those um, in your life. Then also think about what you're willing to commit to. Some of the things that we recommend are pretty time intensive. And so, you know, sometimes it might not be worth it right now, but you could consider something in the future. Um, and advocate for yourself. If you feel like you're not being listened to, um, you know, make that known. If and um, you know, make sure that that you are having discussions about these things that are important with you. We say early and often, and with whomever is willing to listen. And so, the more people have an idea of the things that are important to you, and this is anything in your life, then the the better that they can help you um, maintain and, and achieve those things. Um, so I like this slide because this is talking about the interdisciplinary team of care uh, of someone with Parkinson's disease, and um, it's a little hard to see on the screen, but there are circles. The most important person in the medical team is the person with Parkinson's disease and their care partners. Um, so really important for you to be part of that decision making and, and developing those priorities. Uh, and unfortunately, in our healthcare system, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And so if you feel like you're not being heard, speak louder, speak to someone else, um, and, and find those second opinions. All right, shameless plug here. I, I had already talk, talked about um, people in my research study. At this time, we are not recruiting people with Parkinson's or with DBS, um, but we will be in the future. So if you're interested, please reach out and then we'll have your contact information on file. Um, there's my email and my phone here. They're also on the, um, the flyers here. I will not be answering my phone over um, while well, I'm uh, on leave, but leave a voicemail and my lab manager will get in contact with you. Um, and then there's a, a QR code to a, a survey to see if you qualify. Um, and then, thank you. I think we might have some time for questions. Well, first, a ground of applause. That was awesome. It was awesome. She was she was a favorite. Uh, she was a favorite at the symposium, and now I, I mean, I mean, I, it was wonderful. Uh, and to see the visuals of it was really good. And the flyers are over there on her table. So these are the flyers. So by all means, grab one. But we will take questions. We do have time. Also on the Zoom crowd, and I will come over here now. And uh, oop, can I borrow? Oh, here it is. Um, I'm going to, uh, let's see, in slideshow, stop slideshow. There we go. Okay, so we've got it up right here, and we've got some folks there on our Zoom crowd. So if you have a question on the Zoom crowd, let us know. We've got two folks back there that are monitoring that, and they'll let us know. Do you all have any questions? Raise your hand. I'll bring the mic to you. Okay. Now, you have to speak loud. I just had the swallow test two weeks ago. And uh, the results came back, said to turn my swallow and turn my head to the left. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that do to me? Great question. Um, so turning your head to one side closes off one side of the throat. And so then the other side works a little bit harder. So we usually will turn to the weaker side. And so then the stronger side can really help push the food and liquid down. So that just means that there's a little bit of an imbalance between your left and your right side. I give a lot of talks, and the last time I was given one, the critiquer said, I've heard you give a whole bunch of talks, and you are speaking a whole lot softer now than you used to. I didn't even realize that. So, you know, I mean, he was seeing something. What short-term thing can I do other than mentally thinking, speak louder? Is there anything else I can yeah, take a deep breath. So that breath is the power source behind our speech. And if we have more air flowing through our upper airway, then our vocal folds will vibrate stronger and then that'll come out as louder speech. Okay, we got a question back here. 
I have to ask you, I know a lot of, I know a lot of people when they take a pill, you know, cause they're hard, they go like this. And I heard that that's not right because it closes off your airways. Can you explain that a little? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we do this often because it will kind of force the pill to the back of the throat or to the back of the mouth. And again, our brain does not like swallowing a solid and not chewing it. It's really strange thing just because we feel that hard texture and we want to make it soft. So like if we eat something like a cookie or a carrot, we don't swallow it down whole and we chew it up. So it's the texture of, you know, think soft things. And so kind of hurling our head back is something we sometimes learn to, you know, get the pill towards the back of the mouth, but lifting the chin actually opens up the airway and position. So if we have water also in the throat, that'll help water gravity will bring it down into our airway. And if we're not ready to swallow, our airway will be open. And so that causes it's easier for food and liquid to enter the airway if our, if our chin is up. If you've ever taken a CPR class, they tell you to lift the chin because mm -hmm. that opens up the airway for, for doing CPR. Um, if you are having difficulties with pills, you can, and you feel like you do want to do that head position, you can try to put it kind of as far back on your tongue as you can. Sometimes taking pills with something a little bit heavier helps like applesauce or pudding, or even like chewing up a solid food and then putting the pill in that. Cause that that's a little bit closer of a texture. And so that can make it easier to swallow too. Also, I heard that you're supposed to kind of bend forward sometimes. So sometimes that's a, that's a personalized approach though. So for some people, if food and liquid is getting into the airway, tucking the chin will actually close it off a little bit, but it only works in certain cases for certain reasons that things enter the airway. Gotcha. So some, some people will say, oh, that's a blanket thing. Just tuck your chin, you'll be fine. But the clinicians here, I'm sure I'll see some, some head nods is sometimes we ask our patients to do that and they actually swallow worse. And so we, if you're having difficulties, it's really good to get that evaluation so we can see what's going on in the throat so we can make those personalized recommendations. Gotcha. Good. Any other questions? Yeah, there's Over one. Here? Okay. Uh, so I was just in a bad car wreck and I had 14 bo broken bones in my spine. Oh, wow. Um, and doing very well with recovery. One of the things I had was speech therapy mm -hmm. and I had to go down for the swallow test as well. And what they found out was my little flapper just doesn't function all the way that it should. But recommendations from the doctor was make sure you chew your food and take so smaller sips when you drink. And that just definitely helps with the flow of, of all that going down. So just the point if it helps anybody. Yeah, and it, again, that's kind of a, that's a personalized thing. So sometimes small bites and sips help because that's kind of less things that can go wrong. But smaller bites and sips have less weight and less kind of sensory information. So sometimes larger bites and sips actually can trigger things a little bit better. So um, while that's the case for you, again, not necessarily a blanket recommendation. Okay. Does somebody have a question over here? Okay. So it appears, is it, oh, okay. It appears that um, a lot of swallowing, uh, that muscles are involved a lot. And also that carbidopa levodopa um, usually affects muscles, as does DBS. So I'm surprised that why doesn't they help? <laughs> yeah, we're surprised too. And we actually don't have great answers. Um, so the person who I did my PhD with um, up at the University of Wisconsin, she runs a ant research lab. And so she's able to look at what's kind of happening at the molecular level in the brain and in the muscles in a Parkinson's model and how that impacts speech and swallowing. So particularly for swallowing, but then also for speech, there are centers within the brain stem that control the, the muscles of the head and neck. So if you think about the spinal column, those nerves come out for the limbs. The pathways in the brain are different than the, the muscles of the head and neck. Those come out of the brain stem. And the connections between the brain stem and the basal ganglia and the spinal cord and the basal ganglia are slightly different. 
Also, the muscles for speech are really central in the body, whereas the limb muscles are, um, you know, very, they're far on the edges. And so the way the brain controls those and how that changes in Parkinson's is slightly different for the muscles kind of in the center than, than the muscles on the edges. Wow. All righty. And, and again, we still have time for questions. So here, here you go. Sometimes I have trouble swallowing a pill, especially a capsule, because I've got like a stickier saliva lately. Mm -hmm. And so you take a light capsule, you put it in there if your mouth is well lubricated, it'll feel like it sticks. And so I try either more water or sometimes I get some solid, try to push it down. I haven't figured out the best move yet. Yeah, so that's, that's um, certainly common. So if there's kind of sticky mucus in your mouth and throat, or if you have a dry mouth or throat, that can like help the things will actually get stuck. Um, and it sounds like, you know, that recommendation to drink more liquids or to put it in something that's a little heavier. If you feel like you have kind of thick mucus, kind of that's not associated with an illness, that might be a sign that you can drink more because if we are better hydrated, that, that can get thinned out. Any other questions over here? Boy, this is this is awesome. I mean, this has just been fabulous. How about any over here? How many uh, speech therapists do we have in the room? Raise your hand. All right, look here. Well, we got yeah. So thank you all for coming. They they, they were probably learning a lot here from the professor. Okay. Any any other questions? All right. Well, one of the things that's an added treat. As you know, at the end of our meetings, we always have, or at the end of the speaker, we always have an exercise uh, segment, and we do physical therapy exercise with our boxing, and we do that. We have done other speech exercises, and we have done some yoga, but this time, rather than having somebody else, I figured we got the expert right here, so I'm going to let you do some speech exercises. Oh, and before we go there, Deb, did we have any questions, Deb and, and Don, from the Zoom audience? No? Okay. So, and I know I'm kind of out of the camera here, but I would like for you to, to lead some vocal exercises, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And so, again, I'm going to, we're going to do a couple exercises, and, and you'll kind of see where I'm going. So, first, I want everyone... We're going to say ah and hold it as long as we can. And I just want you to kind of listen to, it doesn't have to be a beautiful note. And everyone has kind of a different pitch. And so we're just going to embrace it. Um, and then we'll do some um, exercises after that. So we're going to do kind of a baseline task. I'll say three, two, one, go. Yeah, so not yet, but I, I will say that. And that'll be my cue for, for you to go. All right, ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> um. Oh, great. Oh, awesome. Okay. <laughs> so that's just an example of our respiration and our voice. And so I'm going to walk you through some ways to, again, like, like I talked about pumping up that respiration. So I'm wondering if I could get a volunteer. It's hard for me to hold the mic and show what I'm doing. And as you'll see, the demonstration is going to be a little hard in my current situation. No, I need someone to, to demonstrate, to help me demonstrate. Okay, Stan, so I'm going to make sure that you're on camera here. I'll have you put one hand on your chest and one hand on your belly, and I'll have you take a deep breath, and we're going to watch which hand moves more. And try that again. Okay, did, which hand did we see move more? The upper, yep. So I talked about how there's different ways that we can make the lungs bigger. There's these muscles, we call them the chest accessory muscles. And then there's the diaphragm. Good, excellent. Yep, no, I, I need you still. I'm just giving you some encouragement. You're doing great. 
So the diaphragm is a much stronger muscle than the muscles of our rib cage. And so these muscles, if we, I'm breathing up here, they will give me air, but it's not gonna give me as much air. So Stan, I want you to breathe and I want you, you can look down and I want you to only move this bottom hand. No, <laughs> I want you to, yeah, to only have this hand come out as you breathe. And out, yeah, try to get that to move a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And if you can kind of think about sending your breath down as it comes in. Yep, you can see a little bit of a change. That's called diaphragmatic breathing. So I want everyone now in the audience, Stan, you did an excellent job. You can sit down and give Stan a hand. One hand on the chest, one hand on the belly. You can do a couple breaths just so, and you can look down because sometimes it can be kind of hard to tell. See which one you use. And if you're kind of breathing up here, see if you can keep your ribs relaxed and try to make your belly stick out as you breathe to make this hand stick out. I don't have a whole lot of room to do diaphragmatic breathing right now. So if we do diaphragmatic breaths, not only do we get a bigger breath, but it's more energy efficient. So we're not gonna get as tired. So this is something that we talk about and that we learn when we do voice therapy and speech therapy and in singing. Um, and it's just, yeah, a good way to, to help get more energy. Also, if you're kind of leaning back, I want you to sit up nice and tall, feet flat on the floor and try again and see if you can get that belly to move even more. Deep breaths. Yep, so our posture is going to impact how much air we can get into our lungs as well. Okay, and you can relax. So what I'm gonna have us do now is take a big, deep belly breath and we're sitting up nice and straight, our feet flat on the floor. And we're gonna do that ah uh, and hold it out again. So three, two, one, belly breath. You can hear how much louder and stronger we sound. Great, excellent, yep. So that diaphragmatic breathing is gonna help us be able to breathe for longer and to breathe more efficiently. Now, and we talked about breathing out, so that's breathing in, so that diaphragm goes down, our belly goes out. Now, if we wanna breathe out and if we want a lot of power, we can engage our abdominal muscles. And our abdominal muscles are very strong and that will pull the diaphragm back up and send energy out. So we're gonna try that one more time. Big, deep diaphragmatic breath, I'll count you off. But big, deep diaphragmatic breath. And then as we send energy out, we're not gonna go for length now, but we're gonna go for power. So for loudness, bring that belly in to send that sound energy out. So I'll count one, two, three, breathe in and then go, okay? Oh, uh, three, two, one. Three, two, one, big belly breath and suck your stomach in. Great. Yeah, and you can relax. So yeah, again, the, that... Uh, <laughs> That was amazing. That was even louder than yep. before with that mm -hmm. big, deep breath. That's super. Yep. So big, deep diaphragmatic breath in for a good, big inhale and really efficient breathing. And then if you want power, engage those abs to really send the air out. Um, so that's just a, a nice uh, tip for, for um, you know, ways to be better understood. And that's actually... We think of kind of a hierarchy of speech therapy. And you might think like, oh, if I'm, if I'm not speaking very clearly, I need help with my articulation. 
That's actually one of the later things we work on. It's easier to be better understood if you have that powerful breathing. And so that's kind of the foundation of, of some of the work that we do in speech therapy. What's a tip for sometimes whenever they start speaking too fast? I know that's part of the articulation you were just referencing, but is there anything to get them to slow down? Yeah. So besides just kind of monitoring and trying to speak slowly, that's something if someone is speaking too fast and if it's someone that you're speaking with quite often, that's where we can work with the communication partner to work on like a signal. So like, okay, you're going too fast, slow down. Because again, the, the ability to kind of monitor and, and keep track of things uh, is a little bit tricky in people with Parkinson's. And so if you have a trusted communication partner who like, can give you a hand sign to slow down, that can, that can be really helpful. Just a visual cue. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Any other questions? Well, golly, I just, again, applaud you. Thank you so, so, so much. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. And as, as you notice, sometimes here it's hard to see the slides, but uh, again, this was recorded and it will be on YouTube. It will be in the next newsletter. So you could look it back over and just fast forward through me and you can listen to her and see the slides really, really good. Oh, we have a question, David. Oh, he wants to- It's a girl. A second. <laughs> yeah. All right. Super. Good question. Good question. Thank you so, so much. Yes, we appreciate you. it. All right. Thank you. Oh, and also Mary Jane has a PDF version of the slides. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to watch me again, <laughs> uh, I just want a little piece of information. <laughs> All right. We will be sure in it. Okay. So now we're going to jump right back to the meeting. Oh, wait, I do see a chat here. Do we have some? Oh, that, that was on that one. Okay. Not a problem. Okay, thank you so, so much. Okay, slideshow, we're gonna come right back to my slides. And hmm, I have to bounce right down here. Oh, that was a slide to do exercises. I was gonna show you, show you guys that. Uh, <gasps> Even birds do voice exercises. So see, I had a little, little something there. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> raffle time, raffle time. Okay, did everybody get a ticket? Because if you didn't get a ticket, we will bring you one right now. And we got some cool gifts. By the way, as you, I've shared this before with folks that the raffle is uh, we were going to do a gala and we just haven't done it. And so all this stuff is in my attic and I'm pulling it down to periodically give away to everybody. So uh, if you have something at home that you think is really would make a wonderful raffle gift, feel free to bring it and we will add it to the supply. But I'll go on as my raffle team is coming up here. I will go on and uh, share with you next month. Next month, and I'll come right over here. We will not have a speaker in June. It'll be June 22nd, but we're going to have a vendor fair. Now, the vendor fair is fun, 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 because in this gymnasium, we will have about 50 vendors. And these vendors will have uh, cookies and refreshments or whatever refreshments at the table. Also information, a lot of freebie stuff, you know, all the freebie stuff if you need notepads or stuff like that. But also door prizes. Yes, so we will be having door prizes. Our vendor fair, if you've never been to one, is one of the most fun things that people like to do. And it's gonna be usually every June. So think about that. I'll be sending out announcements and letting you know who will be coming. But we anticipate having about 50 vendors and it'll be awesome. Also before, because I get away real quick, uh, as you know, we have to, one of your jobs as volunteers is to put up our chairs. So we have to put up the tables and chairs. That's one of the agreements that I have in order to be able to get this facility. So after the meeting, be sure you stay, if you don't mind, to help us put up chairs and tables and help uh, Kat. Miss Kat right here is going to be helping to uh, put up all the tablecloths and get everything cleaned up. But I want to recognize my Zoom team. I am now very, very fortunate. I've got some folks that are just awesome. So Stan, if you'll stand up. And uh, Gail and Wayne. I also had Chuck. Chuck was helping me. Stand up, Chuck. These folks, who else? Did I leave out anybody else? 
They, they, this is my Zoom AV team. They're helping me, but more important, not more important, but equally as important. In the very back, I've got Don and I've got Deb, who is our webmaster. And I have Lauren, who is the support team helping, and they're the ones recording. So you can see it takes a whole team effort, and we just appreciate everyone. But the other one that was really our cameraman was John Henry. So John Henry right here was also part of the team. He is our cameraman that was keeping up with this and keeping up with everyone. So now on for great tickets and great stuff. What are we going to give away first, ladies? Sure. Okay. Tell, uh, this thing is, uh, these are night lights. So you're going to get two night lights. They're really nice. You just plug them in and they're great and they're directional. And the winning number is, I'll just look at your last three, five, five, three, zero. <coughs> five, three, zero. Must be present to win. Five, three, zero. Oh, no, we don't have one. Wait, wait. <coughs> oh, Davis won. Awesome. These are night lights. You can put that around. Perfect. Okay. The next thing, what are we giving out next? Oh, another one. Okay, some more night lights. This one is five, six, seven. Five, six, seven. These are some great directional night lights. Yay! We've got a winner. <coughs> Ooh, okay, that sounds good. Cozy socks. Ooh, I don't know what you guys, sometimes it's just kind of neat to have cozy socks to run around the house in. Okay, the winning number is 529. 529. Ooh, we got a winner. All right, he's going to love wearing those socks. Sure, if you want to. Yeah. You're in charge. Okay. This is one of those things they call a, a banana basket, a banana hanger. And then you can put fruit down at the bottom. Well, all right. You know, Father's Day is coming up for you. Know it. That'd be a great Father's Day present, huh? <laughs> all right. The winning ticket is five, six, nine. All right. There you go. A father got it. Okay. You can hang your bananas there. <laughs> <laughs> okay now we have got an authentic french cookbook wow does it even have the price tag on it let's see if it's, well it looks like it's worth a lot uh, anyway okay it is is this our last one our last gift okay okay da -da -da, drum roll five okay well that's sounding good so far everybody's kind of a winner two oh five two seven Five, two, seven. A winner? Oh, my goodness. Nobody won it? Then guess what? We get to go again. Okay. You might get another chance now, y'all. Okay, ready? This one is five, seven, seven. Five, seven, seven. She's yeah. Hey, all right. Okay, that's Marilyn. All right. Thank you, ma'am. We're going to have some good goodies. <laughs> anyway, thank you to the Zoom crowd who, who joined us. And uh, sometimes you got to be present to win. So hopefully you can join us. Hey, please come next month. So next month, I believe that's June 22nd, fourth Thursday. It'll be a vendor fair. It's going to be lots of fun. And yes, bring friends and family. There's no speaker. It's just going to be a thing to see all sorts of stuff, get some goodies eat some cookies. And so thank you all. Thank you for helping us put everything up. And thank you to my Zoom team and all my volunteers. Thank you. Okay. Have a nice day. Bye.